This is a Trident Disabilities audio archive recording. Colonizing the Cosmos, Astro's Electrical Future by Ewan Riss Morris, published September 14, 2022. Read by a Trident volunteer. During America's Gilded Age, the future seemed to pulse with electrical possibility. Ewan Riss Morris follows the interplanetary safari that is John Jacob Astor's A Journey in Other Worlds, a high-voltage scientific romance in which visions of imperialism haunt a supposedly perfect future. Below that is a photo in black and white that is set nearly on another world, with mushrooms and dead trees in the background, with soldiers firing at creatures coming out of the sky. These creatures nearly resemble dragonflies in which they have humongous wings and beady eyes, except they have two front legs with sharp claws and a mouth full of teeth. The description for this photo is The Combat of Dragons by Daniel Carter Beard for John Jacob Astor's A Journey in Other Worlds, 1894. If we traveled back to America's Gilded Age, the closing decades of the 19th century, what would the future look like? The economy was booming as cities expanded and industrialization gathered pace. Railways spread across the country, fueling westward expansion with the opening of the first transcontinental railway in 1869. European investors flooding this growth, growing market as they jostled to cash in on American prosperity, and American spectators made their own fortunes too. Day by day, the United States seemed to be accelerating into the future promised by industry. Nikola Tesla, reminiscing years later about his 1884 arrival in New York, remembered thinking that America was more than 100 years ahead of Europe, and nothing had happened to this day to change my opinion. This new tomorrow was to arise through the power of innovation. In 1876, Americans celebrated a century of independence with the Centennial Expedition in Philadelphia. The huge coreless stream engine that dominated the main exhibition building was 45 feet tall, and through a series of shafts more than a mile in length powered almost every other machine present. At the same event, Alexander Graham Bell's telephone was exhibited for the first time, and American ingenuity showed no signs of abating. Almost 20 years later, viewing Chicago's Columbian Exposition in 1893, commentators believed they were seeing the stuff of which the future would be made. It was a shining vision, serenely waiting the admiration of the world. What did the privileged elite of the Gilded Age, those who often funded and stood to profit most from this vision, make of all this? How would they think about their own place in the future that technological ambition and innovation seemed to offer? Below this is a picture that seems to be over a river with a bridge and a huge huge building in the background. The painting includes many colors, almost like a sunset, and in this huge building is a huge archway and many towers at the top. The description for this photo is lithogram of the Department of Electricity, which was powered at the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago using Westinghouse and Tesla's alternating current technology. Luckily, one of them told us exactly how we imagined the century to come. In 1894, New York publishers D. Appleton and Company released it, A Journey in Other Worlds, A Romance of the Future, written by John Jacob Astor VI, one of America's wealthiest men. The Astor clan had originally made their fortune in the fur trade and had added to their millions through investment in land and property. In 1897, John Jacob would build the Astoria Hotel in New York next to the Waldorf, owned by his cousin William. The hotel was both a symbol for the Astor family's wealth and a honeypot for New York's fashionables. Tesla himself lived there until he was turfed out for failing to pay his bills. It's Astor's authorship that makes the book such a fascinating insight into the Gilded Age's fantasies about its prosperous tomorrows. A Journey in Other Worlds is an example of what was once called scientific romance. The thriving genre was not only published in book form, but also in popular magazines aimed at a middle-class readership. Publications such as Cassell's Magazine, Pearson's Magazine, or The Strand, where Arthur Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes stories first appeared, allowed readers to discover scientific romances about strange new inventions, machines that could think, and travel in space. Some of Astor's readers might, for example, have been familiar with Edward Bulwer Lytton's The Coming Race, written a couple of decades earlier and featuring a superhuman race of subterranean electricity harnessing beings. They would have read Jules Verne's Fantastic Tales of Adventurers Journeying to the Center of the Earth or Descending 2,000 Leagues Under the Sea. 
They might have read Edward Page Mitchell's short story, The The Ablest Man in the World, in the New York Sun about a man with an artificial brain. And in the same year as Astor's book was published, readers could have encountered Gustavus W. Pope's Journey to Mars, The Wonderful World. Following this is a photograph, almost like a Polaroid, that is worn at the edges and featuring two men. The first one is blurred out closer to the photo, but the second man is focused on, and the description includes him as the 1909 photograph of John Jacob Astor leaning from a train window. That is to say, Astor's tale would have been familiar territory for his readers, though presumably their knowledge that its author was one of the world's richest men gave it an added edge of interest. Written at the end of a century, the story was set in the year 2000, the beginning of a new millennium. It describes a world transferred from technology, awash with free energy. The novel's protagonists are already on their way to Jupiter in its opening chapter. Relaxing in the aftermath of the triumphant campaign, to straighten the Earth's axis, doing away with the inconvenience of seasons. Readers are treated to a potted history of the past century, including how the world's politics have been transformed, before following their heroes on a jaunt through space. Astor's future ran on electricity. There was nothing novel about this. His readers would have found any other choice peculiar, to say the least, for everyone knew that the future would be electrical. As early as the 1830s, pundits were enthusiastically predicting the day When half a barrel of blue vitriol and a hogshead or two of water, the constituents for an electrical battery, would be enough to fuel a ship across the Atlantic. By the time Astor was writing in 1894, electrical power cables were already festooning the streets of many American and European cities. And a scheme to generate electricity from the Niagara Falls underway with Astor as one of the directors. George Forbes, the project's consultant engineer, boasted that visitors would see a whole new world created. Nikola Tesla was busy trying to persuade investors, including Astor himself, to back his grandiose plans to distribute electrical energy without wires across the globe. Electricity was the fuel of choice for scientific romancers. Below this is a photo including many light tubes going in shapes of stars, squares, circles, and even spelling out the word light. The description for this says it is this display by Nikola Tesla for the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago, featuring wireless lighting tubes. Following this is another picture with two sides. One is the world that has drilled out with many dots and shadows on it. The second is one with the continents and everything, a more realistic picture with the tower at the top with sparks of electricity. The first one has, in quotations, analogy, and the second is realization in quotations. The description for this photo includes a diagram illustrating Tesla's plans for the worldwide transmission of electrical signals from his 1919 article, Famous Scientific Illusions for Electrical Experimenter. What's particularly remarkable about Astor's vision is the sheer detail. It's all very carefully imagined. This is a future in which electricity in its varied forms does all work, having superseded animal and manual labor and everything and man has only to direct. Everywhere, electricity is generated by the power of wind and water. The electrical energy of every thunderstorm is also captured and condensed in our spacious storage batteries. The windmill and dynamo that thus utilize bleak mountain tops, that totally discovery seem to be but indifferent successes in Dame Nature's domain. Renewable electricity is used to run our electric ships and water spiders, railways, and stationary and portable motors. For heating the cables laid along the bottom of our canals to prevent their freezing in winter and for almost every conceivable purpose. Everyone has a windmill on their roof. Astor offered his readers a blueprint for the coming century that laid out how they would get from their present to the electrical future. This period, AD 2000, one of his characters says, is by far the most wonderful the world has yet seen. The wonder was the result of science and technology, of course, and all that plentiful electrical energy. It's no surprise that Tesla thought, wrongly as it turned out, that Astor would be an easy touch for cash to fund his dreams of wireless power. The spread of Republican ideas in the aftermath of the French Revolution more than two centuries earlier and the great advances in science that accompanied it meant that education was universal for women as well as men, and this is more than ever a mechanical age. 
Astor's future was the end point of the inexorable march of progress. Science had generated this perfection of civilization. It was only a perfect civilization for some, however. In the same year that Astor published A Journey in Other Worlds, women's suffragists presented an unsuccessful petition with almost 600,000 signatures at the New York State Constitutional Convention, while the United States Supreme Court passed the Civil Rights Repeal Act, overturning congressional protections for the voting rights of black Americans. The inequality of Astor's present remain largely unaddressed in his vision of the future and in some respects are hideously amplified. While women benefit from universal education, there is no mention of suffrage and the physicians of the future are solely, are solely serious and thoughtful men whose research, whose research finds the physique, especially of women, wonderfully improved. Meanwhile, Astor's 20th century is primarily shaped by white Anglophones conquering every region of the planet. A journey in other worlds cannot imagine a future that is not built from colonial violence. Below this is a picture published from a magazine called Frank Leslie's Illustrated Weekly and includes women who appear to be suffragists gathering and signing a petition. The description for this has cover of the May 3rd, 1894 issue of Frank Leslie's Illustrated Weekly depicting the petition efforts of the women's suffrage movement in New York City for the Constitutional Convention. Astor's novel describes how, in the aftermath of the Franco-Prussian War, continental Europe descended into a perpetual state of warlike antagonism between the great powers of France, Germany, and Russia, whilst England preserved a wise and profitable neutrality. One result was a technological arms race as the competing nations developed larger and deadlier armaments. Metallurgy flourished in the search for advanced weaponry. Chemists developed better explosives, and the invention of flying machines made them all too dangerous to use. These tremendous sacrifices for armaments, both on land and water, had far-reaching results, and as we see it now, were clouds with silver linings, said Astor's future historian. The Great War never came, and the continental rival stagnated in perpetual stalemate. The rival nations had their pains for nothing or rather for others than themselves. The other result was mass migration, as weary Europeans left the continent and its antagonisms for better lives elsewhere. At the same time, the jealousy of the continental powers for one another put a stop to these nations' dreams of empire, leaving the world free for exploitation by Britain and the United States. English was on its way to becoming a universal language through eradication rather than acquisition. Spanish and Portuguese elements in Mexico and Central and South America show a constant tendency to die out, reports Dr. Cortland with sinister ambiguity. And the parish residents of these regions are gradually replaced by the supposedly more progressive Anglo-Saxons, making the study of ethnology in the future very simple. By the end of the 20th century, Canada had joined the United States that now spread over both North and South America. Britain, in the meantime, had free reign to assimilate much of Africa and Asia into the British Empire. Astor was writing during the scramble for Africa. Due to improvements to condenser technologies allowing water to be made from air, mile after mile of Africa has been won for the uses of civilization, and the erstwhile dark continent has a larger white population now than North America had a hundred years ago. That was the perfect world from which Astor's protagonists set out on their jaunt to the planets. A future that reflected the Gilded Age elite's fantasies of empire and colonial settlement. Their planetary encounters would be similarly revealed. As far as his characters were concerned, their own world had each reached perfection, and it was time to embark for the stars, the next stage in humanity's manifest destiny. The spaceship built by Colonel Bearwarden, president of the Terrestrial Axis Straightening Company and his companions, is also called the Callisto the name of Jupiter's second largest moon. Constructed entirely from beryllium, an electrically conductive element, the ship is powered by a pergy, a term that has been invented by the author of scientific romances, Percy Gregg, in his 1880 story, Across the Zodiac, to describe a kind of anti-gravitational force. Astor is vague about how exactly his version of a pergy works, but the implication is that it operated through some kind of modification of electricity. On the next, appears to be two different frames, the first being a space UFO unidentified object floating somewhere, 
in the sky with birds and clouds everywhere and a large river running through a city below. The second is that same spaceship outside in outer space with a galaxy in the background leaving what appears to be a planet. The description for this is the Callisto is going straight up and the signals from the Arctic Circle by Daniel Carter Beard for John Jacob Astor's A Journey on Other Worlds, 1894. Bear Warden chooses Jupiter and Saturn as the expedition's ultimate destinations, planets that seem to offer the best prospects for human habit- habitation and colonization. I am convinced, he says, that we shall find Jupiter habitable for intelligent beings who have been developed on a more advanced sphere than itself, though I do not believe it has progressed far enough in its evolution to produce them. The belief that life existed on other planets was widespread throughout the 19th century, and the notion that the various planets of the solar system might be at different stages of evolution was also a common one in scientific romances. H.G. Wells would use it in his War World just a few years later, in it, for example. As far as the adventurers on the Callisto were concerned, the planet's primitiveness made an ideal space for human con- conquest, almost as if it had been made for them. In due course, they are off with great pomp and circumstance, flags waving and the 21-gun salute ringing in their ears. The space through which Astor propelled them was increasingly familiar territory by the 1890s. They whizzed past the moon. There was something awe-inspiring in the vast antiquity, antiquity of that furrowed lunar surface, by far the oldest thing that the mortal eye can see. That lunar surface had been photographed as early as the 1840s and was exhaustively mapped in the 1890s. They passed by Mars and its two satellites. As with the moon, Astor's readers would probably have been quite familiar with the Martian surface. Given Giovanni, Scheer, Pirelli's, and Percival Lowell's observations of canals on Mars, it is perhaps surprising that his travelers do not spot any. They do, however, see a comet, and they take a ride inside its tail and they pass through the asteroid belt, finding an atmosphere, oceans and continents, with mountains, forests, rivers, and green fields. Below this seems to be two more frames, one of which that spaceship from the previous photos is seen traveling through comets in the galaxy with planets and stars in the background. The second one features a man and a woman holding each other in front of a building shaped like a sphere. This is faded out in the major photo with the spaceship involved and Saturn in the background with the galaxy. The description for this one is the Callisto and the Comet and the Return by Daniel Carter Beard for John Jacob Astor's A Journey on Other Worlds, 1894. Below this is two more frames. The first one featuring primitive animals including an elephant and a humongous ant with huge jaws and birds in the sky and leaves and plants everywhere. The second is three men riding on the back of what appears to be a huge armadillo with a scorpion and dinosaurs in the background with leaves and in a forest as well. The description for this one is a battle royale on Jupiter and the ride on a giant tortoise by Daniel Carter Beard for John Jacob Astor's A Turtle, A Journey in Other Worlds. Flying at last over the surface of Jupiter, the crew of the Callisto marvel at the towering and massive mountains and smoking volcanoes. Heading west, they see gently rolling plains and tablelands that would have satisfied a poet are set in agriculturalist hearts at rest. Their response to the sights is revealing of what Astor thought the planets were really for. How I should like to mine those hills for copper or drain the swamps to the south, explained Cole Bear Warden. Jupiter was a future Africa or American West, a space deemed ripe for exploitation. Not even did Columbus, standing at the prow of Santa Maria, the new world before him, feeling the exultation and delight of these, of these latter-day explorers of the 21st century. Saturn, on the other hand, is an abode of the dead. Spiritualism and theosophy were all the rage in fashionable, fashionable American society during the 1890s, and Astor was not the only one to play with the idea that the planets might resi- represent higher spiritual planes. A few years later, Louis Pope Gratacap would devote an entire novel to the proposition that Mars was inhabited by the dead, who could be communicated with using wireless tele- telegraphy. In this case, the presence of the spirits does not prevent the Callisto's crew from continuing their interplanetary safari. When they eventually returned to Earth, 
They might be spiritually elevated, but they are also well aware of new worlds still to conquer. Remember, we have not been to neither Uranus or Neptune nor Cassandra, which may be just as interesting as anything we have seen, Bear Warden says, taking leave as if leave of his fellow travelers. Should you want to take another trip, count me as your humble servant. Following this is two panels. The one on the left features three people. Two of them are fairies, almost appearing as ghosts, reaching for a man who's looking at the sky and the galaxy with a bright streak in the middle and flowers in the background. The second on the right is a great hall of people, with many people with their hands raised, almost smoke billing around the building, with an archway as people are leaving. The description for this is A. Ralt's Vision, and they look into the future, by Daniel Carter Beard for John Jacob Astor's A Journey in Other Worlds, 1894. A Journey in Other Worlds is a fascinating and revealing novel, which tells us a good deal about the way in which Astor and his readers viewed the future. This is important because even though the future did not entirely match their fantasies, those fantasies were still key to making the modern world. It's a future saturated with technology and electrical technology in particular. Electricity is what makes Astor's future world go round. Literally, in fact, since it was electricity that Astor imagined pumping water back and forth between the poles to fulfill the peculiar ambition of riding the Earth's axis and eliminating the seasons. This was the future predict projected by inventor entrepreneurs like Tesla too, and embodied in world fairs. Astor's story offers insight into just how seductive this vision of the future was to the Gilded Age's privileged elites. It's striking that the novel's protagonists are men clearly modeled on Astor himself. They are powerful and wealthy, the heads of corporations and committed to technological fu futurism. More striking still, though, is the theme of empire. Bear Warden and his crew were heading to Jupiter a specific kind of adventure. Jupiter's exotic, Jurassic or Mesozoic creatures, or Saturn's dragons, were just big game as far as they were concerned. This was space travel a safari, but like Victorian big game hunters and explorers in Africa, both real and fictional, even as they bagged the trophies, they were casting covetous eyes over the landscape too. Jupiter and Saturn, and presumably the other planets in due course, are places to be colonized. They were places where form farms might be established, Minds sunk and resources extracted. They are different in scale, but not in kind, from how Astor's novel envisions continents such as South America and Africa in the 20th century. Blank canvases, shorn of subjects, on which to paint dreams of supremacy. As things turn out, of course, Astor never came anywhere near the future he imagined. He died on April 15, 1912, the richest victim on the Titanic. But it's clear that the future he imagined and wrote about was a future tailored for men like him. A description of the author, Ewan Riss Morris, is a professor of history at Aberystwyth University. He graduated in natural science from Cambridge University in 1985 before going to complete an MPhil in 1986 and PhD in 1989 in history and philosophy of science there. He has he has published widely on the history of science, including Nikola Tesla and the Electrical Future, Icon 2019, and most recently, How the Victorians Took Us to the Moon, UK Icon, US Pegasus Sports Books, forthcoming 2022. He lives in Aberystwyth, Wales.